Hi all, so today we're going to be going over the chapter 3 practice problems. These are from Solomon's 11th edition, and this is just taken from our class materials on Canvas. So I'm going to go through and work these problems, but I recommend that you pause them and try to work, pause the video and try to work the practice problems on your own first. Once you get into the habit of um, you're starting to see you're getting answers right more consistently and things seem to be going well, then I recommend that you actually start doing multiple questions at once before you check the answers just to build your confidence. Because on the exam, you're going to do 27 questions in a row and not be able to check what the right answer is. So I kind of recommend you get out of that habit as you're starting to get concepts more nailed down. Okay, conjugate base of sulfuric acid. So for conjugate acid and base, um, let's just review this. I think we talked about this in your Gen Chem class, but just as a review, we have something like if we'll have like HCl and maybe water. So if you had these two things um, and the reaction goes to This oxygen will attack the proton, so a new bond will be formed from these lone pairs. And the lone pairs left behind will go to this chlorine atom. So the new structure that's formed will be, there's still a lone pair on there, but one of the lone pairs was used up to make this bond, and then a Cl minus. Okay, so if we're looking to see what the acid and base is here, the acid is going to be the thing that lost a proton generally. So here we have HCl and it becomes Cl minus. So this has lost a proton. So this is going to be our acid. And after the acid has lost its proton, it becomes a conjugate base. The other thing, if this is the acid, this must be a base. So this is our conjugate acid. So something that has lost its proton, oh, I just realized that wasn't on there. Something that has lost its proton becomes the conjugate base, and something that's gained a proton becomes the conjugate acid. And an easy way to think about this is here, if we're going HCl plus H2O gives H3O plus and Cl minus, the HCl has lost an a proton going this way and the water has gained a proton going this way, right? But if you go the opposite way, if we're going from H0 plus to H2O, that is losing its proton. So now this becomes the acid and the Cl minus becomes the base. The Cl minus would steal a proton to make HCl leaving behind water. So essentially what we're seeing here is these are the acids. So if the reaction is going this way, HCl is the acid. If the reaction is proceeding this way, H3O plus is the acid. So these are our two acids. And they, when you have an acid that loses a proton and what's left behind becomes negative, that's your conjugate base. So if we have sulfuric acid, which looks like this, I believe, and some kind of base, a base will steal that proton and leave, I just put H, oh man, <laughs> I've got to make sure that you guys can see this whole page, here we go. Okay, so the base will steal the proton and leave you with HSO4 minus and the base plus a proton, whatever that base is. So the conjugate base of sulfuric acid here is HSO4 minus and the conjugate acid of the base is this H base, the proton bonded to whatever base you have. So to answer your question over here, a conjugate base of sulfuric acid is and then here's your answer, HSO4 minus. Which is not a bronsted Lowry acid. So a bronsted Lowry acid is basically something that can generate or donate a proton. So H2O, although it doesn't want to do this, 
if a base that's strong enough comes along, it can steal this proton and give you base. I'm just writing H base, um, just so that we don't have to come up with a base every time, plus OH minus. And that's how we get things like NaOH. This doesn't have a proton anywhere, so I'm assuming this is our right answer because there's no proton that can be given up. But let's check through all of them just in case. NH4 plus, it has a positive charge. It wants to lose a proton. Any old base would be, most bases would be able to take that and leave behind the lone pair, making a proton bonded to a base and in H. So that's definitely um, an option. The next, this is, hopefully you recognize the structure, a carboxylic acid. It's an acid. It wants to give away this proton right here. And then the same thing, this isn't a particularly strong base. It has a pKa of about 25. So it's not like incredibly strong, but it's also not the weakest either. It's on the like weaker end of more common acids that we see, but it is, it does have a proton to give up. So it is possible for that be used as a Brunsted Lowry. So the only one that doesn't have any proton available is answer choice B. Okay, um, three. Which are the Bronsted Lowry bases? So again, we're going to identify the acid is what loses a proton. So this water starts out as H2O and it becomes OH minus. This is your acid and this is your conjugate base. So that means this must be the base. It's stealing a proton from this water and this is our conjugate acid. So if the reaction moves forward this way, this is your base and this is your acid. If the reaction moves this way, this is your base and this is your acid. That's why a base becomes a conjugate acid and the acid becomes a conjugate base. So our two bases are these two structures, PO4 three minus and OH minus. HPO4 2 minus is the um, conjugate acid, so that can get you mixed up. And because these are all minus charges, you can't just know based on what's usually called a base or what's usually called an acid. You need to be able to identify which one's losing a proton. That one's your acid. Okay, question four. What is the product of the following acid base mechanism? So this is an acid-base question, but even more importantly, this is a arrows question. So generally when I'm looking at curved arrows, I talked some about the double barbs or whatever. We're going from the flow of electrons. We're following the flow of electrons. So if we have a positive charge here, and you have something that's basic, we'll do OH minus. A negative, the negative is always gonna be the one that acts. The positive is not gonna be the one that acts. So you're going from this negative and it's coming over here and stealing that proton. And the way I like to think of it is a negative person will go out and go on the streets and steal. A positive person's not gonna do that. So our negative species, our negative molecule, that's going to be the thing that attacks. You're not going to be attacked by a positive person on the street, right? Positive is not going to be the one that attacks. It's a negative. So it's attacking. It's coming at you. And it's going to take what it wants because it's a negative person. It's a negative species. And it's just going to leave behind the broken pieces, which in this case is a lone pair. The analogy kind of breaks down because this is more stable after <laughs> something has been taken from it, which is not usually true when you've gotten something stolen from you. But um, that's how I think of curved arrows. So we see these lone pairs, this negative species attacks, a bond is formed. These lone pairs go into a bond forming between this proton. And then this bond is broken because you can't have two bonds to hydrogen and it's left behind as a lone pair. 
So this is asking you, not only do you understand an acid-base mechanism, but do you understand the flow of electrons? And that is even more important, I think, for organic chemistry. So in this case, this lone pair here, I'm going to redraw this. These lone pairs are coming and taking this proton. So that's the first step. So I'm just going to draw that. So we have our oxygen. This bond has broken. And instead of drawing that full arrow over, I'm just going to make it a lone pair right here. So that gives us a bond. These two electrons are what attacked and formed a bond between here. If it's easier for you to imagine it this way, you can imagine you have this oxygen, this hydrogen, and if you want to imagine them close together, you can imagine your OCH3 minus comes, and these two electrons are forming a bond here as this bond is breaking. If that's easier for you, you can picture that. So if you just follow this first step, you'll end up with these two species, the O minus and then this HOCH3. But that's not where it stops. This electron, the lone pair that was just added in, forms a double bond in the um, adjacent carbon-carbon single bond. And because, oh, I drew the double bonds in here wrong. And because, oh, I'm drawing all kinds of crazy things. Because carbon can only have five bonds, if a new bond is formed right here, then one of these bonds has to break. And so they draw this bond breaking and forming a lone pair right on the carbon. Now that's kind of a trick, I guess, in organic chemistry. If you draw Say there's a lone pair here. If you draw it to the middle of the bond, that indicates a new bond is formed. If you draw an arrow to the atom, that indicates the lone pair will form right on that atom rather than a new bond. So that's how you can tell the difference between a lone pair and an atom. So this carbon has a lone pair. It's This bond breaks and forms a lone pair right above it. So that is going to look like a lone pair above this carbon, a double bond formed, these bonds down below, nothing happened to them. They're still kicking. And then we have our oxygen. This carbon, if you calculate the formal charge out, it'll have a negative on it. And then our other species is still just fine over here. So those are our three, or our two final structures. So then you just have to come over here and see where those are. And that's answer choice A, I believe. This one's close. The only thing that's missing is this lone pair didn't get drawn in. This one, it's it sort of draws a transition step, but if you just, a transition step is like, as the new bond is forming and this bond is breaking. But if you know that hydrogen is only supposed to have one bond, you can eliminate this base just on that. And same thing here. This carbon has one, two, three, four, five bonds to it. So if that carbon has five bonds and you know that's not right, then you can eliminate that. So then you can narrow it down just to answer choice A or B. Okay, question five is the same kind of thing. In this case, it's kind of a weird base. It's H minus. We, you don't see that as much in OCHEM, as much as you do like OH minus, but it's the same thing. Can you follow a set of curved arrows? So hopefully you can, um, but I'm gonna draw this out again, just so it's easier for you to see. And these hydrogens, are usually not drawn out because they're implied hydrogens, but in this case, 
to follow the arrows that are showing them to you. So if you want to think of it like this, you've got your H minus. This hydrogen is going to form a bond here with these two lone pairs, and this bond will start to break. Okay, so that's what they're drawing. But it's not going to form a lone pair on the carbon. The way they have the arrows drawn, it'll form a new bond here. Let's just draw this first step. We've got a new bond formed here. Sorry, oh no, I missed a carbon. Okay, so we have a new bond formed here, but there's something wrong right here with this carbon, right? There's one, two, three, four, five bonds to it. That doesn't work, so that's why we have this final arrow where the double bond is breaking and you have a lone pair on the top. Oh. <laughs> and see how the arrow is pointed to the oxygen and not to another bond? That's how you know it's gonna be a lone pair and not a new bond formed. And there's one hydrogen still there, but it's implied so it doesn't need to be drawn out. So a lot of times, here you can see there's a positive charge next to this negative. So an ionic bond, but it can be dissolved in solution. So then if the negative charge moves around, the positive charge is just going to go find it because negative likes positive. So I'm guessing we'll end up with H2. That was formed when this hydrogen attacked this hydrogen. And then this structure right here. So let's see if we can find it. I believe that is... This one's wrong because no single bonds were broken, so that's not going to be correct. This one's that intermediate step. It has five bonds to carbon, so we know that's not right. Ah, this one's close, but again, how many bonds are this there to this carbon? So if you just know that carbon can't have five bonds, you can already narrow it down to A, D, or E. So I think the right answer is answer choice E. Yes, and that hydrogen is there, but it's not drawn because it's an implied hydrogen. So answer D should be a right answer. Okay, which of the following is a Lewis acid? So Lewis acid are electron acceptors. So they basically need a place to put a lone pair of electrons. So I'm just going to draw these all out for you. I remember that Lewis acid are acceptors and Bronsted acids have the boring definition. So it's the one that you've learned your whole life, just that they make protons. That's how I remember it. You don't have to. That's just how I remember it. Okay, so this is what we have here. If one of these bonds breaks, you get a lone pair coming in here. The base steals this. It is accepting a lone pair because now it has two lone pairs where it didn't. So technically this is the Lewis acid because it's accepting a lone pair. BF3, uh, we can go through the Lewis structure if you want, but boron only has three valence electrons and fluorine has seven. So the total is 24. And so the Lewis structure ends up looking like this, 2, 4, 6, is that what, 18? And then 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. So there's an empty valence shell here on this boron. It only, it's neutral because it starts with three valence electrons and it has three bonds around it. So its formal charge is zero, but it does not have a full octet. So it will accept a lone pair. So if even this water came and bonded here, you would it would accept that lone pair. And you'd end up with a structure that looks like this. And this would now have a negative formal charge because boron has three valence electrons minus four bonds is negative one. And this Oxygen will have a positive formal charge because oxygen has six valence electrons minus one, two, three bonds minus two lone pairs equals positive one. And so 
This boron has accepted this water acting as a base, and it's a Lewis acid. Now, NF3 is different. It's very similar to boron, to this structure, BF3, but nitrogen has five instead of three. So instead of 24, there's 26, which means there are two electrons left over. You can draw out the structure if you want. There are two electrons left over for the to fill that nitrogen octet, so it does not have any space to accept electrons. So NF3 is not a Lewis acid. And same thing with OH minus. You've seen OH minus. I mean, it is full up, full octet. There is you would never have a base come and steal this and just have an oxygen like this. That would be insane. That doesn't happen. So that's not also going to be one. So your answer is actually answer choice E because both A and B can be a Lewis acid. The next question, this species is a carbon-based Lewis acid. So which one of these carbons basically doesn't have a full octet is what it's asking. And you should be able to answer that very quickly. Um, this carbon down here, might trip you up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That is a full octet, even though it's not neutral. All these carbons have four bonds around them, so they have a full octet. So we're left with this carbon with a positive charge, absence of electrons. It will, it has almost the same structure as this BF3. It will absolutely accept. So answer choice C is a good option. Answer choice E is interesting. It will accept an electron, but it needs to accept an electron pair for it to truly be considered a Lewis acid. So answer choice E is not correct either. You can narrow it down to answer choice C. Okay. Which pair of species are both bases in the following reaction? So we, we've seen this before. The acid is the one that loses the proton or accepts an electron pair. In this case, HCN goes from HCN to CN minus. So this is a conjugate base. This is our acid. This, if we're going the opposite direction, H3O plus has three protons and then it has two. So it's the conjugate acid. And that makes this the base. However, it makes sense for you to look at it. It makes sense for me to think this way, which one's losing a proton? That's the acid and the conjugate base. This way, which one's losing a proton? That's the conjugate base, or the conjugate acid and a base. Or you can identify the acid and the base on this side and then know that the conjugate base goes with the acid, the conjugate acid goes with the base. You can always check yourself by making sure the conjugate acid is losing a proton if the reaction went this way. So our two bases are H2O and CN minus. So that, that should be answer choice A. Okay. Sorry, my pages are a little stuck together. Earlier when I was reviewing this, I spilled some baked potato. So sorry. You'll see that. It's kind of gross looking later. Which of the following organic compounds is the strongest acid? Okay, this always messes me up. I don't know why. Something about the way... I memorized pKa just gets me confused. So, strongest acid is the smallest pKa. And I literally write that out every single time because I think I memorized the list from like most acidic. We had like a chart in the book that's like most acidic to basic. And so when I think highest pKa, I think highest on the chart and that's wrong. <laughs> You want lowest number for the most acidic. In this case, strongest acid is the smallest pKa. It's at the top of the chart in your book. Okay, so smallest pKa value will give us the strongest acid, and the smallest pKa value is zero. So that's the right answer. Amazing, quick and easy, as long as you know how pKa's are arranged. Which of the following substance has a hydrogen atom with a pKa of 25? Okay, so basically, if you want to succeed quickly in this chapter, it's just easiest to memorize your pKa's. I don't recommend memorizing everything. 
I don't want you to just memorize, you know, how reactions work or whatever, but just to have these numbers handy, have a chart of some kind that you can quickly memorize. Dr. Berhe has one posted online, although it's not comprehensive. It's going to make your life easier. You also need to be able to recognize functional groups. This is a carboxylic acid. If you're not quick at that, you're going to have a hard time on this next exam. And I had some students tell me they had a hard time on this exam because they weren't able to go quickly from condensed formula to bottom line formula. So definitely try to be on top of that. So this is a carboxylic acid. PKA of carboxylic acids, depending on their environment, is 4 to 5. Okay? This is a carbon-carbon triple bond. If there was a hydrogen off of that, it'd be 25, but they tricked you. There's no hydrogen off of this carbon-carbon triple bond. There's only hydrogens off of, uh, well, that one is a double bond right here. Maybe. I think that might be a typo. I think that should have a 2 right there because there's no other place for it to bond to. Um, but so these are all single bonds. So the pKa of a carbon or of a hydrogen off of a fully saturated or with three bonds around it, all single bonds, carbon is um, actually 50. Here we do have a hydrogen off of a carbon-carbon triple bond. That pKa is 25. But it has to be a hydrogen off of it. It can't be like a hydrogen adjacent. So in this one, you have CH3. I'm assuming that should be CH2, CH2. And then this carbon, CH3, CH2, CH2, this carbon is part of a carbon-carbon triple bond, and then it finishes with another CH3 right here. This is drawn in a straight line because, remember, this bond angle is 180 degrees because it's sp hybridized. There's no hydrogen here or here. There's only these carbons that have sp3 hybridized hydrogen, so those pKa's are all 50. Here... Your triple bond has a hydrogen directly bonded to that carbon. So that pKa is 25. It's more willing to give up. What a lower pKa, lower pKa, stronger acid, it all means that the molecule is willing to give a proton up. Or another way of putting it is it's stable enough without the proton to be willing to lose it. So if you're thinking about that as like a human analogy, it's like healthy, well-adjusted parents can send their kids off to college and maybe it sucks a little or it hurts a little, but they'll be stable and fine without it. Whereas um, maybe a family that relies on their college-age student for income cannot survive without their college-age student leaving, so they don't leave, right? So um, sp3 hybridized can't, they're not stable without those protons. The, the lone pairs that's left behind is not going to be able to be handled by this proton leaving. But maybe a lower pKa, more acidic, more stable if the proton is lost. That's how I think of acids. Um, so this is going to have a pKa of around 25, so that's your right answer. This, these all have pKa's of 50, but these right here is a pKa of about 45 off of a carbon-carbon double bond. And be sure that you're looking at, you know, this has sp3 hybridized, so these have pKa's of 50, but it also has a hydrogen with a pKa of 25. So be sure that you're looking at all the different species of hydrogens to see what their pKa's are. Okay, so next one. Oh, I didn't do this one. This has, these are all fully saturated, so they were all going to be 50. And then these protons off of an amine group are actually, I think, 38. pKa of 38. So that doesn't have one that's 25. Hydrogen atoms from which physicians are most likely to be abstracted when the following is treated? Okay, so NaH is a base, that's H minus, Na plus. If this is treated with a base, the lowest pKa, most acidic. That's the one that's leaving. Lowest pKa, most acidic. So then you can just go through and identify the low pKa's. All these carbon single bonds with hydrogens off of it, the pKa is 50. This one too, this one too, all those are 50. There's 
one hydrogen here, one hydrogen here, those pKa's are 45. There's not a hydrogen here, so that doesn't have a pKa. You're looking at the pKa is of the hydrogen attached to the carbon. This is no hydrogen, so that won't be included. And this has a hydrogen with a pKa of 25. So the right answer is answer choice A. I have seen a lot of students get forget that there's not an implied hydrogen here. There's already four bonds to carbon, and they answer one and two because it's a carbon-carbon triple bond. But that doesn't work. There's not a hydrogen there. And we're looking at pKa, most acidic, is about the willingness to lose a proton most easily. So... If you don't have a proton, like here, you can't lose it. So carbon one is the is the only one. Okay, which is the strongest acid? Again, this is a pKa question. Strongest acid, lowest pKa, smallest number. So this is a alcohol. It's got to be recognizing your functional groups and know their pKa's are sixteen to eighteen. This is a carboxylic acid, depending on the um, environment, it'll be between five and four, four and five. Carbon-carbon triple bonds, the pKa of this is going to be 25. Carbon-carbon double bonds, the protons off of those, it's going to be 45. In carbon-carbon single bonds with protons off of them, pKa is 50. So the strongest acid is the lowest pKa and that is the only one with acid in the name. If you're ever not sure and there's a carboxylic acid, I've seen sometimes students, you know, just be like, well, it was an acid, so I picked that. <laughs> um, that's not always true. Usually if there's a positive charge, it's more willing to lose its proton, but carboxylic acid is relatively acidic. So rank the boldface hydrogens from most acidic to least acidic. Okay. So this one I see students get one thing in particular wrong on this kind of consistently. And um, that is this positive charge. Okay, so a lot of times they say, well, that looks like an alcohol or water. Um, so it's probably going to be like 15.7 or 16 to 18. But if you look on your list... If you have a hydronium ion, the pKa of that is negative 1.7. So if you have an oxygen with a positive charge on it, it's around negative 1.7. This, although it is an OH, you have to pay attention to that positive charge. There's three bonds to that oxygen. It wants to get back to stability. It's going to be willing to lose its proton, and its pKa is going to be closer to hydronium, where oxygen has three bonds and a positive charge, than it is going to be to water. So students get that wrong a lot. Similarly, um, ammonia and ammonium, the pK of ammonia is like 38. It doesn't want to lose a proton. It's fine. It's happy. It's stable. Ammonium has a positive charge on it, has four things bonded to it. It does want to lose an electron because it's not, you know, it's willing to lose a proton because um, it's got a formal charge. It wants to be neutral. So its pK is actually closer to like nine. So these two are not the same. And these two are not the same. So if you see this positive charge, that pK is not going to be close to that of alcohol. It's going to be closer to that of a hydronium ion. That is the most common question I get on this set of practice problems. Okay, so what's nice is if you know um, pKa's, this is quick. You can just line it up and rank it. If you don't, um, the positive charge is going to be the, you can guess, is going to be the most willing to lose a proton. So if you just know that pro positive charges like to lose protons, you can eliminate answer A, D, and E because two is on top. That's risky. I would not recommend going into a test like that because it's not always true. I think we'll have a question here in a little bit where that's not true, but it is, you know, an option for you. 
So this hydronium ion, negative 1.7. This, uh, you're looking also at the bolded hydrogen. So it doesn't matter any of these other ones. They don't matter. We're looking at the bolded hydrogen. This one's 25. This one off of a carbon-carbon double bond is 45. This one off of an acid, carboxylic acid, is 425. Don't get those mixed up. 45 between 4 and 5. And then this ammonia is 38. So this is the most positive, so we can narrow it down to either answer choice B or C. And they both have two lined up. So then the difference here is basically is one or four more acidic. So um, the second one, four to five. So then our next question is between one and five. Well, carbon-carbon triple bonds are 25. Five is 38. So the one that has one first is going to be your right answer. So that should be answer choice B. Okay. 14 is the same kind of question. If you know your pKa's, you're going to be able to get this quickly. Make sure that you assign this as ammonium, which has a pKa of 9, not 38. So this is 9, this is 38. See the difference is that positive charge and four bonds. This bolded hydrogen is um, on an sp3 hybridized, so it's 50. This carbon-carbon triple bond is 25. This carboxylic acid is between four and five. And this off of a carbon-carbon double bond is 45. For some reason, it really helped me to memorize these in order. I don't know why, um, but I just memorized 25, 45, 50. I don't know why. It just helped me. Maybe that'll help you too. So the most acidic here in this case is the one with the name acid, but there's also positive charge. So that's why I think you just need to memorize your um, pKa's and then you're not risking like, well, the positive charge or the word, the functional group with the word acid in it be the most acidic this time. <laughs> uh, so we can eliminate answer choice A. D and E, so that gets us down to B or C. Well, they both have this as the most acidic, and then now you're vying between either 5, which the pKa of that is 9, or 3, which the pKa is 25. And these would be switched if you assign this as 38. So they're looking to see if you know that this is more similar to ammonium or ammonia. So 5 would be the next most acidic, so the right answer would be answer choice B. Okay, a group of acid arranged in order of decreasing acidity is this. Okay, so this is the most acidic, and this is the least acidic. There's something that's important to know. Stronger acid is going to give you a weaker conjugate base. Because an acid that loses a proton is becoming more stable. You know, if you're a really strong acid, you really want to lose a proton, you become more stable, then that species is not very reactive. So, for example, with water, you know acid is reactive because it burns your skin. That acid is trying to lose a proton. It's not happy. So when it's a strong, that's a strong acid. So when it loses its proton, it's a pretty stable structure. It's a strong acid. It wants to get to this stable structure. This stable structure is stable, so it's not a strong base. It's not trying to break down more. It's stable. So a stronger acid gives you a weaker base because it's willing to lose its proton because what it breaks down to is very stable. So this question tells you we're going from most acidic to least acidic, which means if that is the least basic to most basic conjugate base. It's the conjugate base that they're talking about. And that's the question it's asking. What is the arrangement of conjugate base in decreasing order? Well, if this is the most basic and we want to go to the least basic, we can just flip this around in terms of conjugate bases. So C, C triple bond 
is going to be your first, and there's only one answer choice that's like that, so it's got to be D. So if carbon-carbon triple bond lost its proton, it'd be this. If water lost its proton, it'd be this. This is a phenol. If it lost its proton, it'd be this. Carboxylic acid or um, uh, nitrogen. It, is that nitric acid or nitrous acid? I can't remember off the top of my head. Nitric, I think. So this is convenient because sometimes you'll get a question about bases and it's like, which has the biggest, which is the strongest pH? Which has the best pKb? If you can switch it quickly from its base into its conjugate acid, you can arrange based on just the pKa's and you won't ever have to mess with pKb at all. So this is really useful. Okay, which acid below would have the strongest conjugate base, the weakest acid? I always write it out. I'm not just doing that for you guys. I do this because I lose track. Weakest acid has the biggest pKa. So that's what we're looking for. The biggest pKa is answer choice A. Um, if you really want to think through the logic of it, if this acid lost its pKa, it becomes, or lost its proton, it becomes O minus, right? And that is a base that wants to react. So the less willing this is to lose its proton, it's probably because it's going to be a more reactive structure. And that's why the weakest acid is the strongest base. Okay. Um, now we're on the last page. There's my baked potato stain, and I apologize. <laughs> um, okay, so sorry about that. There was queso also. It was baked potato and cheese. So which of the acids below would have the strongest conjugate base? Oh, I think that's a repeat of the last question. Strongest base, weakest acid. Weakest acid is answer choice A. Yeah, so I think that was a repeat. Not sure why. I didn't catch that before. Strongest conjugate base. Yeah, same, same question. Okay. Um, and 18 and 19 are also duplicates. So this is asking kind of a different question. I feel like this is pretty advanced. One, two, three, four, five. So this is one, two, three, four, five. This is carboxylic acid. And carboxylic acid in general, if you lose this proton, it's stabilized by the fact that if a base came along, stole this, and left behind a negative charge, this is what the structure would look like, this lone pair could come up here and it would actually have a stabilization from resonance. But there's another way you can stabilize the lone pair that's left behind. If you're left behind with a lone pair, so say this base came along and stole that proton, and you're left with an O minus, if there's something that's really electronegative, it will pull the electrons towards it. So if you had a fluorine, for example, really close by, that's very electronegative, and it will be pulling the electrons towards it. And that distributes the negative charge away from just focusing right here. And so that also stabilizes the lone pair that's left behind. And the more stable your conjugate base is, the, or I guess the more stable your structure is after you lose your acid, you lose your proton from your acid, it'll be a stronger acid. Like if the more stable this is, the more willing this structure is to lose its proton. Because if it loses its proton, it becomes a pretty stable structure. That's what we were talking about with water earlier. Hydronium wants to lose a proton because water is pretty stable. And if this lone pair can be stabilized, it'll be more acidic. So your answer choices here are all carboxylic acids. They're all the same base chain of carboxylic acids, same number of carbons. And what they have is different halogens coming closer and closer, basically, to so that you can feel the effect most strongly of the electronegativity of it pulling the 
electrons away and stabilizing them. So we have, oh, sorry, I drew this one wrong. The first one, there's a, C, a chlorine on the very last carbon, a bromine here, um, two bromines, one over, bromine and a bromine. Sorry, I did not draw those directly bonded. There you go. Um, this one has a fluorine here. I don't think I moved over far enough. I think I got that structure wrong. So I have this, oh yes. This, these bromines actually were closer. I got that structure wrong. That's why you gotta count your carbons. I've been doing this for a really long time and I still just almost caused myself to get the wrong answer because I wasn't paying attention close enough. And then here's a fluorine on that same carbon. And then the very last one, is two fluorines on that carbon. So the more electronegative atoms, the better. So fluorine is more electronegative than bromine. So fluorine and then chlorine, it's the most electronegative atom. So you can narrow it down based on that. Also, the closer it is, if you had a fluorine here versus a fluorine here, this one will be more stabilizing. So both of these are in a good position, but there's two fluorines here. So you'll have Electrons being withdrawn, making this proton willing to leave because the electrons, lone pairs that are left behind, are going to be dispersed. Another way that you can think about it, if it's easier, is you know if there's electron withdrawing, if there's a, an electronegative atom, it's pulling electrons towards it in a dipole moment and leaving behind a partial positive. So then we're left with this partial positive is also pulling electrons towards it. So this oxygen is partially positive and oxygens don't want to be partially positive. So it wants a base to steal that proton and give it more electrons. So either way you wanna think about it, if you wanna think about how this is partially positive, so it wants protons, or if you wanna think about the lone pairs being dispersed, Either one of those is fine, whichever makes the most sense to you. But the right answer choice here would be answer choice E. And these are, I think, just repeats. So don't worry about that one. And then the very last one, which reactants would give the following product. So you could have two approaches to this. You could just look at every single one of these and see if you could figure out how they would make this structure. But it's going to be an acid-base reaction. This is negative. So this is likely the conjugate base. And this is likely the conjugate acid, right? So that means, also there's a lone pair implied here. If this is the conjugate base, then it's lost a proton. So it's acid pair with this conjugate base probably looked like this. And if this proton was lost, it had to go somewhere. This is the only proton we're seeing in a place that makes sense. So that means that this con the base that goes with this conjugate acid probably did not have that proton there. So that's how I reason my way through. I identify the conjugate base and the conjugate acid. Um, negative charge usually indicates you lost a proton. Positive charge or an extra proton usually indicates that you gained a proton. So I'm going to guess this would be the two structures we're looking for. The only one that has the OH is A. This lithium bonded to the nitrogen is a little weird. I'm not sure why they drew it that way. Realistically, it would be like this nitrogen, the formal charge is 5 minus 2 minus 4. So that's negative 1. And then lithium is usually plus one. So really the lithium would be hanging out nearby and this would be negative. I don't know why they drew the bond like that, but this would be answer choice A. And if you want to make sure you understand how the lone pairs of um, arrows work, this nitrogen would come, the negative person's attacking. So this neg extra electrons is attacking. This bond will break and it will leave behind a new lone pair.
So we've got oxygen with a minus charge. And a bond has now formed between this nitrogen hydrogen, which is how we end up with that. Okay, so that's your video for chapter three. I hope that was helpful for you guys. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out.